And we're back with a very, very special guest, a hometown boy, one of my good, close personal friends. He is the Scottish supernova or champagne supernova, whatever you want to call him. He is Noam Dar, and he is now part of the WWE Cruiserweight Classic. Noam, how you doing? Kenneth, it's good to it's good to speak to you. As a, it's not been too long since we spoke, but it's felt like a, felt like forever. Yeah, it's one of those weird interviews where I know you, but I need to put on this mad professional voice as if like. <laughs> As if we don't know each other, so no, it's, very it's, nice. it's very nice to speak to you, Noam. You too. It's lovely. There's a lovely game of role play that we have here. <laughs> well, we won't go there. But um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So for you, I mean, it's anybody who's who's in Scotland as a wrestling fan knows who you are, has known for a long time. And then the news came out earlier this year that you were going to be part of the Cruiserweight Classic, which I think as soon as that was. I mean, as soon as that was announced, did people just start saying to you, well, you've got to be in this, surely? Yeah, a lot of people were asking me, like, are you going to go to this? As in, like, uh, like I could just decide whether to turn up or not, which um, is, is a bit hilarious. Uh, but no, a lot of people were really, like, uh, touting me for this tournament. And, uh, and you know, I was kind of like, um, I'm really glad that you got that response because, you know, it, it can answer it. <laughs> If we got a response like, no, don't put no I'm in it, then um, it would have been a bit of a, uh, I would have been too encouraged. But yeah, no, everyone's been so positive about it since, since the announcement. And then obviously this past week, your your first round match aired and you were victorious over Gurv Sira uh, from from India. Um, it must have been quite surreal for you as a guy that's grown up watching WWE. Um, I assume probably has your own network subscription. Um, and now you're on the network. How did you actually get to celebrate it happening? Did you sit and watch it? Did you watch it with some friends? Did you get, or were you working? Uh, no, like when the actual, um, like when the, my episode came on uh, last week, uh, I was on, down for just in, just in the house, kind of, like it, I was almost too nervous to watch it. Like I've got a really, I've got a bad habit of not watching myself first. So like, um, and I know I need to, to watch myself more for obviously, uh, to get better and whatnot, but like um, I was like, I'll I'll watch it live just to kind of so I can see what everyone else is seeing, really. Um, so but yeah, no, I was I was kind of surreal to see it and, and also just how much uh how much kind of promotion, how much WWE are putting behind this whole tournament and then putting obviously behind the actual competitors is uh is, is great to see. And for people who might not know like, all your history, how did you first get hooked on wrestling? What was your first thing that, that made you become a wrestling fan? Um, I think it was something just like, uh, it must have been like one of the kind of recap shows or something on like Sky One, because uh, I don't think we had Sky Sports at the time, and it was uh, just after WrestleMania on 19, I'm sure, uh, around about that time. It was just, uh, Brock Lesnar was um, feuding with Triangle and Team Angle, and he was actually trying to, uh, attack your friend Paul Heyman, um, <laughs> and he, he kept for some reason. For some reason, he kept. It's sort of unbeknownst to me. Obviously, I was like, he just kept picking up Paul and putting him on his his shoulders, and I didn't understand this. I thought if you grabbed him and you know, two hundred ninety five pounds, why you know just punching him in the face? But obviously, I didn't realize that this was uh, the the magic of wrestling, and an F five is more devastating than a punch to the face. <laughs> so. Um, so and that was the first thing that that, that hooked me, and uh, I think I went straight down after a straight after watching that. I went straight to my friend's house, who I knew watched wrestling, and I was like, uh, "Listen, do you have any wrestling DVDs or videos?" Um, um, and they just got SmackDown, Shut Your Mouth, the game, PlayStation Two, and I was like, "Is Brock Lesnar on that?" He's like, "Yep," and then just spent the entire day putting folk in the shoulders and uh, throwing them sideways for yes, ESI. and then that was that was me since then. I can. Uh, I bullied, uh, I bullied my grandpa to get in Sky Sports and uh, just watched as much as much wrestling as I could. I, th- I thought for a second that you were going to say you F5'd your grandpa, but thankfully that didn't. Uh, didn't no, say. that was a threat. I, I was like, don't make me do one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, well, I guess at least Brock Lesnar's responsible for a lot of things, but maybe he's also responsible for Noam Dar in a weird way. I, I, I mean, not a lot of people would have made that connection, but um, I guess so. There you go. Cheers, Brock. Um, so... Obviously, growing up, you're in you're in Scotland. Um, so you were you were born in Israel, right? But then you were raised in Scotland. That's the yeah. And and mm. being in, being in Scotland, and, and I mean, I guess in that kind of time frame, two thousand three, two thousand four. Um, 
what made you decide to go from being a fan, playing the games, watching it on TV, to actually going to a school and learning to wrestle yourself? So I had like um, so I had a, an, an older friend who was also like uh, really big into wrestling, and uh, like we met just by we met just by chance. Like uh, he'd like moved school and and stuff, and and uh, like we were really good mates. But he was like he was really into wrestling. Like he'd be he'd, he was watching everything. Like he was clued up in Japan, all the American independence. Like he knew everything about anybody you ask. Um, and he was. He was always saying, "Look, I'm looking for a wrestling school, and I want to go and train. Would you want to do it with me?" And I was like, "Well, if you find a school that's not, you know, that's not too far away, I'll do it." Because obviously, I was just a, a, a school student. So, but he actually went down to he actually done a couple of like camps in London and this and that, blah blah. blah. And then he eventually met uh, the guys that were obviously that run the school, um, the PBW Academy now. Uh, and he was like, "I'm going to go to this every Sunday. Do you want to come?" And I and I literally, you know, I was like. I didn't think, oh, if I go to this training school, I'll become a wrestler. Like, in my head, it was just as simple as, like, I want to do wrestling, so then I would have to go to a wrestling school. Like, just in the same that if, you know, if you want to play football, you go to, like, a like a five-a-side or something, or, you you know, it was just that kind of, that full stop about it. It wasn't really like, oh, I should go to this training school, and then in five years, I could be a professional wrestler. I literally just went to, to see what it was about and learn wrestling. Um, and, uh, and then, obviously, I went every week, and eventually... Uh, he fell off, and like that was me. I was hooked. So, and um, and that's ever been that's kind of the way it's been since then. And so, and you you started really young, right? You started at fifteen, something like that. Yeah, I like um, like I started when I, I started training. Um, I want to say the end of two thousand and seven, or like the late later half of two thousand and seven, and then uh, I've done had like my first. Like professional wrestling match in June 2008, just before I turned 15. So like I'm like I really kind of got chucked in at the deep end quite quick. Um, but like I would luckily I was quite a fast learner and stuff, and I think I like it understood the like the actual putting on a show side of it more than you know the kind of the more kind of finer details of it. So like I was able to do like small, small family and friends shows and small trainee shows and just kind of learn and get some experience from them. And this, this sounds like I'm blowing smoke up your arse, but it's genuinely not the case. It's just from, from watching you, something I noticed, because I, I started going to ICW shows maybe about three, four years ago. Um, yep. And I never really knew what it was all about. And one of the things that always struck me about you is you always seem to carry yourself like a star. Like, you always come out and you have an aura about you. You portray yourself as being a star. Is that something that was that you were conscious of sort of coming up with that? Because a lot of wrestlers just come out and, you know, they just they just look like guys. They don't, there's nothing yeah. kind of special about them. But whereas you sort of command the audience, was that something that you consciously worked on? Um, I, I wouldn't say it was a, a conscious effort as much as it was a concern. Like, I was really concerned about... Um, you know, like it was okay when I was younger and stuff because when I was, you know, when I'm 15, 16, you know, I can be a certain way and I can be a certain height. But I was always concerned, like, you know, if I really want to start looking towards the big leagues, then I'll need to be able to, like, uh, almost make myself two different people because obviously you've met me. I'm just a normal sized guy, uh, I'm not tall. Um, so, like, that would, you know, and then there's not like a, there's not like a, there's something so incredible unique in the ring that, you know, that, uh, Mm -hmm. justifies you know being a normal looking dude or whatever so that was something that I always kind of focused on but one of the I remember watching some um it some random DVD or, or it must have been some documentary but it was uh it was talking about CM Punk and uh the that he um Gabe booked him for ROH uh purely off his purely off his like, kind of presence when he came through the curtain to the ring uh, that always resonated with me. I kept that in the back of my head. And then I'd seen the CM Punk again. There was an, a point where someone had made... But you know, when you see him in the... When you, when you see him at shows or backstage or whatever, he just looked like a, a regular dude and, you know, just, uh, you know, running them out. And then once he, once he kind of, you know, got into his, like, essentially his, his kind of CM Punk kind of character and all that, then the difference was, was day and night. And I always, really, I always really liked that because there was nothing I hated more when I was like a young kind of young guy and even still now really when guys will arrive 
you know, to the wrestling to a wrestling show and trying to be like a turned up to a hundred percent or, you know, like trying to be something I'm not, say but you know, just people that were just kinda that, that would act it. Um mm-hmm. so like uh, that always really kinda that always stuck with me, those kinda two those two kinda moments, both for both I won like with uh C N Punk. And uh, when you when you first started wrestling, I guess I mean it must have almost been around the same time I mean, when you when you started. I guess Drew Drew Galloway or Drew McIntyre as he became WWE, oh. he would have maybe just been signed or just been about to be signed at that point. Yeah. But when you start uh, when you started, there wasn't really that many guys from the UK, uh, let alone Scotland, getting the chance to go to WWE. Was that something that made you sort of more determined to try and make that happen one day for yourself? No, I'm probably I'm probably the opposite in that kind of thought process. So like a lot of people, um, like um, a lot of people, if they you know if they don't have one thing to like like you say, so if someone for example can't you know find a way. Essentially, they'll they'll make a way. I'm probably more like if I can find a way that has been done before, then that'll really you know encourage me to do it. So if there was no one, for example, that had obviously been to WWE before from Scotland. Then in my head, the way I think, I would be like, "Oh, well, it's obviously not possible because you know I'm not going to be the guy to pioneer it." But if I've seen that there's literally a way to do something, then I'll find my way to do it. If that makes sense. Yeah. But like, uh, like um, so that so I think that was um, obviously Drew's like Drew's a Drew's a superhuman anyway. Like, if it doesn't matter if he's if he's from Scotland or uh, Timbuktu, he's always going to be. At the forefront of professional wrestling, like his his look and his size, um, and obviously his talent. So when Drew got signed, I was literally just starting my first couple of training sessions, and I he was just leaving, um, and I only met him once or twice way back then, and he was he was lovely. Um, and then now, obviously, that he's on he's on Independence a lot more over here, specifically with ICW. Like um, he's helped me so much, and it's it's great to have him. Of all of us to to learn of him now that he's back here, but yeah, knowing that someone from Scotland had made it to the WWE really kind of amplified my, um, I guess I would say motivation to to try because I know that it had been done before. And then, in in the lead up to you obviously getting to be part of the Cruiserweight Classic and stuff, how what was the what were the parts of working the independents in Scotland and in the UK that that you th- that helped you the most because you've done a lot of different things. You've worked with imports. You've headlined shows. You've done all these different things. Was there any sort of particular things that you felt like really helped you with experience and getting better? Um, I would probably say just uh, I'd probably say the variety of stuff like like you mentioned, especially more uh, especially more the, the, to, like the start of my career, like good first couple of years where you're literally you know. Yeah, you you'll go anywhere, you'll take any booking, and uh, so you end up in some mad situations. And like, uh, like I like I met um I met one of my like you know I guess you'd say real life friends uh out a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't seen him for years, and he was obviously asking about all that. So he'd read about it in the paper and everything, and he was like, "Well, the last time I seen you wrestle it was a uh, in a in an outdoor gala in uh, Simonton, a small village." <laughs> and I remember that then I'd wrestled at literally, uh, what he said in the tent, outdoors in a field in the rain mm. in front of like 60 people in this little village holiday. And um, so sometimes you forget the kind of the kind of mad uh, ex- learning experiences you get from wrestling. But I don't know. I think all these things kind of like um, the the flexibility that you learn um, that it doesn't need to be. Doesn't need to be like a one, two, three, four. This is how it has to be from doing all these kind of different shows, so like the holiday camps. So you know you can do a holiday camp on. So I've done a lot of times. I've done that the um, holiday camp in the Sunday afternoon and then straight to ICW at night time. So the difference, the difference between an ICW show and a and a Haven holiday camp <laughs> is like you know, quite literally night and day. So all those little kind of different learning experiences, you know, I think have really helped me uh, be in a position where. That something might not be like, I might not feel comfortable with something, but I know that like the learning experience is going to be invaluable, and uh, you know, so it gives me like a kind of positive outlook to to any opportunity. But also the classic, because the classic has been so good, and they've looked after so well, and um, it's been all, all positive. It's just been a, you know a really enjoyable experience so far. And when you so once you find out that you're 
how how did you find out that you were in that you'd gotten into the Cruiserweight Classic? Because I, I assume that moment for you must have been quite emotional and quite kind of like a culmination of a lot of hard work for you. Uh, like it really, I guess I could say it was like really out of nowhere. I mean, it was a it was like a week or so after Christmas. I mean, at Christmas time, there's like well for me anyway. Like I try and not not be a essentially try and take maybe a week of that off at Christmas. Um, which is not a very Jewish thing to do, <laughs> but uh, obviously I've got I've got the Scottish side of the family that allows me to justify uh, how celebrating Christmas. Um, but like, uh, so like it really it, Christmas time wrestling really kind of shuts down for me, and I almost kind of switch off from it for a couple of weeks just to kind of get a bit of respite from the year. So like I'm really not in the thought of you know wrestling, 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 wrestling. So I was just at a friend's house and a group of us were playing FIFA, and uh, like. Um, I missed a phone call and then went back to check my bag and it was obviously the yeah, area code for uh, Connecticut and it was um it was uh, actually Mr Regal that phoned me and uh, he'd left a he'd left a voice message and uh and I listened to it straight away and I was all my mates are going come on hurry up play come on it's pause blah, 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 blah. and I was like shut up I can't play FIFA WWE are phoning me <laughs> and obviously they were like. They were like, yeah, of course, just as you're getting beat 3 now, WWE phone you, how convenient. Yeah, like, yeah, so like it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I like my story, so then, I mean, that would like, so luckily, like, um, again, like I said, just because I was so out of the, the thought process of wrestling at the time, that I, if I would have answered that phone without, you know, seeing the area code, I would just assume that it was uh, someone doing a, a William Regal impression, um, trying to have me on. <laughs> so I'm, I'm lucky that I'm lucky that I got to see it was legitimate before I went back, and, and then from there it was like, you know, everything went to what a hundred. I was just like, oh, this is a real thing that's going to happen, and and yeah, here we go. And then when you got over there uh, for the first time, uh, getting to go to the performance center, and I guess meeting all the the executives and the other talent. Um, Again, it's got to be like a really whirlwind kind of time for you to go over there because you, like you say, you're used to doing, you know, Haven's holiday camps or doing an ICW show, and now you're at the Performance Center, uh, about to become part of this kind of revolutionary tournament. Uh, it's mad. I mean, um, it's it's like, well, it feels really exciting to then be uh, in a and obviously a new working environment, but. Uh, to have you know so many to see uh, to see how many moving parts you know WWE has behind the scenes and obviously of course you know on set it's just it's insane it's overwhelming to have that learning experience and obviously I'm excited to have you know at the very least to have had this learning experience that a lot of people don't get and to actually see it you know to to kind of to to be to be the place that everyone wants to be at so to have that you know locked in already is, is, is great and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping obviously I can be there for uh, a m- much longer and did you did you get because a lot of the kind of clips that were going around online of the performance centre was uh, Daniel Bryan taking time to speak to a lot of people did you get a chance to, to speak to him and pick his brains a little bit yeah like um, he's been like uh, extremely extremely positive and helpful to everyone and obviously this will be something that is close to his heart because you know, it's a type of wrestling that he kind of pioneered and he was trying to get onto the mainstream and obviously gained fantastic success of. Um, so he he's been like super friendly with everyone. He's been really nice. And uh, after the first after the like the first kind of set of tapings, a group of us um, went out for like uh, went out for dinner and uh, obviously he he came with and uh, he was just you know chatty and uh, sharing stories and he was just so positive. So it's. Uh, it's really great to see that. And um, obviously, everybody here is is hoping that you're going to walk away with the trophy for the Cruiserweight Classic. Um, after the Cruiserweight Classic is over, uh, this November, Raw and SmackDown are coming to the Hydro in Glasgow. Uh, mm. For the first time, it's, there's never been a, a TV show or a pay-per-view or anything from Scotland, from WWE. Um, if, you were, if you got the chance to be on that show... Is there someone on the WWE roster or the NXT roster that you would like to face? If you could almost pick your opponent in the Hydro, if they were going to put you in that card, who would you want to be against? Well, well if I'm thinking about it rationally, I would just I would thinking you know that um, 
the effort was they had some of the cruiserweights on it would obviously be for Raw because Raw has a cruiserweight division now. So then that straight away makes me think um, to be able to wrestle Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, on that level, obviously, and my you know and I can in a home country would would probably be um, fantastic because we are close friends. I've known him since I was since I started. And he's helped me. Especially at the start of my career, he helped me loads, done a lot of training seminars with him and uh to be, and I've actually wrestled him um in Scotland and uh in Cumnock Academy, a little high school in front of maybe a hundred people. So to then be able to say, Well, look what we've done, you know, back in two thousand eleven to now wrestle each other in the hydro um would be amazing. If I'm thinking about it, you know, in a kind of realistic sense, you know, in a dream sense of course, uh to to wrestle you know, any of the top names would be would be amazing. It would be it would be lovely to see you F five Brock Lesnar in the Hydro. Let's be honest. Uh, well, that was that was I was either it was either between wrestling Brock Lesnar or Zack Sabre Jr. I wasn't too sure. So, uh, but I thought <laughs> I'll, I, I, I'll let I'll let Brock have the night off. <laughs> <laughs> How kind of you! Uh, well, did, the yeah. last the last thing I wanted to ask you because it's, it's and I don't mean to sort of stereotype wrestlers in any way, but like when you talk to a lot of kind of cruiserweight type guys. And you ask about the influence of of uh, getting them into wrestling. Usually, it's a Rey Mysterio or a Daniel Bryan. And for you to say someone like Brock Lesnar initially hooked <laughs> you onto, it's just it's interesting because you just wouldn't expect that that would be your answer. But it's I know that <laughs> that's funny when you say it like that. Like uh, if it's, it's like I'm just like just to clarify that as the answer that I have gave, just in case what someone out there is like. No, nah, no, nah, there must have been some wires crossed. Like literally, Brock Lesnar got into wrestling. <laughs> but like, um, I think it's because I like, uh, I guess I never, um, I never really perceived myself like, especially when I started watching wrestling. Like, I never really, uh, I never really perceived myself as like super duper athletic. So whenever I watched, you know, guys like Rey Mysterio and uh, uh, these people, I didn't really like. I never wanted to go out and do. Like a West Coast pop, purely because I was like, you won't be able to. I, I didn't think I could do a West Coast pop or a shooting star press or four fifties to the outside, whatever. So you know that that kind of switched me off, whatever. But then you know, like like Eddie Guerrero and stuff, and they were out. Even he was doing all his Latino heat stick and his, you know, shaking his shoulders and doing this and that and being funny on the mic and and also Brock Lesnar, you know, well, Brock Lesnar, like watching Brock Lesnar beat people up is gonna get everyone uh, fired up. But like I know that I could. Like at the time, I could pick one of my other thirteen-year-old mates up and put them on my shoulders and throw them off and see what happens quicker than you know I could uh, do like a I'm insulted to the outside or something. So I guess maybe that's where it's came. And then over the years, that's just not really uh, changed too much. Um, but like uh, for AJ Styles, for example, is probably one of my all-time favourites. Um, but he again is quite a different. Um, at the time when he was a, a kind of like a guy. He was quite a different cruiserweight to the normal cruiserweight kind of standard, like you said. So I think that's probably why. It's a refreshing answer, and um, I know I think all of us, when we were thirteen, tried to f five people, but not that we can do yeah. that. Don't try this. At no, home. that's terrible. Don't don't try that at home. Try it in the school yard, like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, know you've you've got past round one. It's only a couple of rounds to go. I'm sure we'll see you at the end and at the Hydro. So thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Hopefully. Thanks very much, Kenny.